The 2025 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for experiments that demonstrated quantum effects, especially quantum tunneling and quantized energy levels, within superconducting circuits large enough to hold in your hand. These breakthroughs form the basis of superconducting qubits, which are at the heart of IBM quantum computers. So there's never been a better time to ask just what is a qubit anyway? For many questions about quantum computing, it's a good idea to begin by asking a classical version of the question. So let's do that here and start with the question, what is a bit? The term bit is actually short for binary digit, and it's something that's capable of storing a single binary value, either zero or one. It's the most basic unit of classical information, something that can represent one of two alternatives. If we have two bits, then there are four possible states, zero, zero, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. With three bits, it's eight states, and so on. So a bit isn't a specific piece of hardware, and it isn't really meaningful to ask what a bit looks like physically. Instead, it's an operational concept that can be implemented using a variety of physical systems. Inside of a normal computer, bits are implemented in different ways, like through electrical charge in the capacitors for RAM, and magnetic field orientations for hard disks. Okay, so now that we know what bits are, let's talk about qubits. The word qubit is short for quantum bit, and qubits are the most basic unit of quantum information. Just like a bit, a qubit isn't a specific physical device, it's an operational concept, and there are different ways to build qubits physically. For example, we can use the polarization of a photon, or the spin state of a half-spin particle as a qubit. Inside of an IBM quantum computer, qubits are implemented using nanofabricated circuits. The zero and one states are created by adding a quantized amount of energy to the circuit, or not. Qubits are capable of storing binary values, zero or one, just like ordinary bits. But unlike ordinary bits, qubits can be in superpositions of zero and one. Sometimes people describe a superposition of 0 and 1 as being in 0 and 1 simultaneously. But that's pretty informal and in some ways misleading. Really, it's more like a qubit can be partly 0 and partly 1 at the same time in different proportions. It can stay in that superposition and interact with other qubits in superposition until we make a measurement. Measuring a qubit involves interacting with it in a way that couples it to an external system, ultimately recording the result in a classical form as a zero or a one. This is also referred to as the collapse of the qubit state, which destroys the superposition. We write down states of a qubit like this using what's called Dirac notation. It's basically a fancy bracket around a state label. The state zero is written like this, and the state one is written like this. As far as nature is concerned, there's nothing special about these states 0 and 1. We could have made different measurements that collapse the qubits to different states, but it is standard to pick 0 and 1 to describe the computational basis, the states you obtain upon measurement in your quantum computer. Sometimes, when we want to refer to a general state of a qubit, we use a symbol like the Greek letter psi. So we might write that psi, the state of the qubit, is 0 or 1, or as I said, even as partly 0 and partly 1. Here, a and b are complex numbers, and these coefficients a and b are very important because they tell us about the probability of measuring the qubit to be in the state 0 and 1, respectively. More specifically, the probability of measuring the qubit to be in state 0 is the absolute value of a squared, and the probability of measuring it to be in the state 1 is the absolute value of b squared. An obvious corollary is that the two probabilities must sum to 1, since those are the only two possible measurement outcomes. So if a is 1, b is 0, and our qubit is definitely in the state 0. If a is 0 and b is 1, then our qubit is in the state 1. If a and b are both equal to 1 over the square root of 2, then the qubit is in a superposition of 0 and 1 where both outcomes are equally likely. 
One way of ensuring that the probabilities sum to one is to write the variables a and b using sine and cosine functions. Since sine of alpha squared plus cosine of alpha squared is one for all angles alpha. So you'll sometimes see states written like this. Cosine of theta over two times the state zero plus sine of theta over two times the state one. But even all this superposition nuance misses an important part of what makes a qubit a qubit. There's an additional degree of freedom which we call the relative phase. It has no classical computing analog, so it's tricky to understand. It's sometimes useful to think of it as a sort of angle between the zero and one states in superposition, but even that's not quite perfect. The simplest thing is to write what we mean mathematically and then see what it does. We can write the state including this relative phase phi as cosine of theta over two times the state zero plus sine theta over two times this imaginary exponential e to the i phi times the state one. We're free to add this imaginary exponential to our expression since it doesn't change the absolute value of that second term, so the measurement probabilities are not affected. This all might seem mysterious if you're not familiar with qubits. So let's look at a visual representation of a qubit called the block sphere. Think of a sphere, like a planet, with a north pole labeled zero and the south pole labeled one. Those are the two possible states of a classical bit. We can represent quantum states with well-defined coefficients in phase as points on the surface of such a sphere. For example, a qubit can be in this state, which is a superposition of zero and one, commonly called a plus state. This state is made on a quantum computer by applying a so-called Hadamard gate, shown here, to the state zero. This same Hadamard gate applied to the state one yields this superposition, which is called a minus state. As a final example, we have this one called I plus, where i denotes the imaginary unit whose square is equal to negative one. These are all superpositions of zero and one. And in fact, zero and one occur in the same proportions here, meaning they are equally likely to be measured. But these are very different states because of the relative phases. All these points lie on the surface of a block sphere. We call these pure superposition states, meaning that the relative probabilities and relative phase are well-defined with the equation we've shown. Or in other words, the state is coherent. It hasn't lost any of its information to the environment. Now, if quantum information becomes lost, the probability of the qubit being in exactly the state indicated gets smaller and smaller. Pictorially, the arrow on the block sphere pointing to the state starts to shrink. It goes to the interior of the sphere and now represents what we call a mixed state. As noise accumulates, the arrow shrinks more towards the center of the sphere and ultimately the origin, indicating a total loss of coherence. All of this is to say that qubits have a much richer state space than ordinary classical bits. And as a result, there are many interesting operations that we can perform on qubits that don't work with ordinary bits. There's a quantum operation that can be performed on a qubit for every possible way of rotating these arrows on the block sphere around any axis and by any angle. And when we perform these operations on qubits and interact them with each other, we get quantum algorithms. Different sequences of operations sometimes give us different possible paths to reach solutions to problems we're interested in. But all of this emerges from the essential nature of qubits. When we start putting qubits together, things get more complicated. We can have entanglement, for instance, but that's a topic for a different video. In terms of actually implementing qubits in hardware, there are some challenges. The bottom line is that qubits tend to be extremely fragile, and over time, the quantum information they store can effectively decay due to unwanted interactions with the environment. For instance, if you initialize a qubit in the excited state one, after some amount of time, the state will decay back to the ground state zero. This time is called T1. And it's one of the key metrics we look at to see how good a qubit is. The longer the T1 time, the better it can perform. 
Another problem is known as dephasing, which is the tendency for a qubit's state to lose its phase, or for the phase to become less certain. The time it takes for this to happen is called the T2 time. And again, we'd like that to be as long as possible, so there's enough time to do interesting things with our qubits. So in order to make a convincing claim that you've actually built a qubit, you need to be able to measure T1 and T2. And to claim you have a useful qubit, those times need to be long enough to run some operations. But that's not all. You also need to be able to control your qubit so you can perform interesting operations on it. And ultimately, you need to be able to interact it with other qubits to perform useful computations. There are a few known ways to build qubits, all with their pros and cons. You can make them from neutral atoms, trapped ions, and quantum dots in silicon. But IBM quantum computers use qubits based on superconducting circuits, a technology that was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2025. Superconducting qubits were explicitly cited as part of the announcement as an important application. So there are many ways to build qubits, and some are certainly better than others, in the sense that they're more reliable and have longer T1 and T2 times, or they're easier to measure or can be operated with greater speed. But the essential mathematical nature of their state space is the same however you build them. I hope this video has given you at least a basic sense for what qubits are and how they're different from ordinary classical bits. For more on what you can do with qubits in IBM quantum computers, check out some of the resources linked in the description. See you next time.